Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Interim Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Bill Maurice, the President and CEO of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. This is our weekly discussion with Dr. Maurice in which we learn about updates in the field of laboratory medicine and pathology. Hi, Bill. How are you doing this week? I'm doing great. How are you? Wonderful. Uh, just thinking about uh, some uh, work I'm doing with the College of American Pathologists on large language models, and it got me thinking about our talk last week and all of the advances in healthcare that we're seeing. And it's been a little while since we talked about artificial intelligence, so I thought that would be a great topic for us today. Yeah, and interestingly enough, I did a little poll on X, formerly known as Twitter, I guess is how we <laughs> talk about it now. Right. Um, and that was in, that was like the number one topic that people were really interested in. One of them, uh, with others, the kind of healthcare and, and lab business. But I think the top one was, you know, artificial intelligence and, and its impact on laboratory medicine. So, yeah, it's mm -hmm. definitely uh, a, a hot topic. And interestingly, it's a hot topic, not just in laboratory or in healthcare. It's like I watched the football yesterday and, and uh, it is now it's like made it into pop culture. So many ads are around. Mm -hmm applications of artificial intelligence in, in a variety of different industries. It's like Salesforce and everything else. It's pretty, pretty remarkable how quickly this is really becoming part of the whole fabric of how we're thinking about things in society and in healthcare. Yeah, this is really one of those disruptive technologies. It's going to change everything about our lives, um, many things, maybe not everything. It is certainly going to impact us in laboratory medicine and pathology. And some people have said, why now? And it's a number of factors is my understanding that, well, first of all, we have all the data that we do that's freely accessible through Google, for example, other major search engines. And we now have the computing power and the storage power to be able to do these really complex uh, artificial intelligence applications using deep convoluted neural networks and uh, large language models, for example. So the time is now. I guess yeah. uh, from what you've been seeing then in the field, where do you think this is headed? What are the big things that jump out at you? Well, I, you know, first of all, it's, I think it's, yes, the time is now, but it's important to have the perspective over the last several years that this has really been coming. I mean, I was mm -hmm. first, it was during my time as department chair, and I think pretty early in my tenure as department chair, that we were approached by a couple of companies that were doing this application of machine learning onto laboratory data for diagnostics. And actually the companies, there were two of them and they were both Israeli based companies because as it turns out, that's where I think now still, but especially at that time, a lot of the expertise in this domain uh, resided because of work in the financial sector and using AI models on data for predictive, you know, predictive analytics. And that's, and, and so, they, the same programmers were like, hey, does this apply to, to, to the applications in healthcare? And they looked at the labs. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other conversation that I remember hearing uh, at, at uh, the JP Morgan business, the healthcare business and investment conference, probably around 2017, was an expert in image analysis, just talking about how quickly that there was now innovation in programming around image analysis. And that was now, gosh, five years ago, right? So I think this has been coming for some time. Mm -hmm. I think our institutions believe that that's what's a big part of Mayo Clinic platform, which of mm -hmm. course has been a focus of Dr. Fruger during, during his tenure. And that really was for people that don't know, in essence, it's really about taking all the data that we have as Mayo Clinic to your point. And that's not just labs, but, but also radiology and longitudinal data because we take care of patients throughout the course of their journey. Um, and how would we create a way for other companies to get access to that data for validation of what they're observing without the data having to leave Mayo Clinic walls for the patient security and things. So a lot of the things that we're hearing now that people might feel like, oh, this is coming so fast, it's really intimidating and who's been paying attention actually has been in the works for some time. So, and it's just now, I think you're right, between the computing power, between the, um, the, the data structure that places have, between just the programming and the, and the speed with which we look at large language models, I mean, that's, did not take exceedingly long to create a really disruptive computing uh, capability, right? So I think it's just, it's really a matter of timing. 
Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I actually was uh, fortunate enough to go to the Computer History Museum, which is out in uh, Silicon Valley just last year. And you got to see everything about how computing and um, just how it evolved over time. And of course, it started with like sliding rollers and abacus and abacus and all of the different uh, counting mechanisms. And then, of course, it went through the things that might seem more familiar to us, Atari game systems and Commodore VIC-20s. So obviously, it's been going on for some time. And our leaders here at Mayo Clinic have had the... Um, just the the vision that they knew this was going to be big. And now I think we're at a point where we're really going to see it now changing our lives and the way we work. And we had talked to one of our previous podcasts about how we're using it in my laboratory in the clinical parasitology laboratory. It's completely changed the way we work. Our technologists are now at screens um, with, comp with microscopes, but it's a, a hybrid environment and their job satisfaction has increased significantly. Our positivity rate is increasing. Uh, we are detecting more parasites that are true parasites confirmed by humans because it's a tool for our technologists. And we've taken our screening time from about five minutes down to 15 to 30 seconds per slide. Wow. So we are seeing it and living it in parasitology. And this is just the beginning. We have a lot of other things we want to do with this next. So yeah, it's, it's very exciting for sure. Yeah, no, that's super cool. And I think that's the other piece of this, um, that when you think about what are catalysts for, for any disruption, and, and I, it, it, and including the application of AI in the laboratories and why I think this will really take off is number one, um, there are real use cases. The fact of the matter is that uh, almost every laboratory has staffing issues. One thing we saw with, with the pandemic and after his retirement of really experienced morphologists have left a lot of labs in a bind for reviewing of specimens as a, for instance, um, just the, the volume of lab data that we're creating, there's a great need for, for these kinds of tools just to actually increase our job satisfaction, increase our mm -hmm. productivity, increase our ability to deliver value to patients. And the other piece of that now is there are companies that are seeing that this is actually not just, because it's one thing to have the ability, you also need the economic drivers for really to get widespread adoption. And I think when they, now that there's businesses that are being created to say, hey, this is where we, these can really create value in healthcare, um, you have that combination, uh, that's when you really start to see a lot of these tools get kind of introduced into clinical practice. And I think that's where we are today. Um, but the, the, so on the one hand, it's a bit disorienting. Uh, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit intimidating for people. But on the other hand, it really is a solution potentially for a lot of the challenges that we have in the clinical laboratory, just in terms of doing our daily work in a way that maintains work-life balance. And these really are solutions, or at least potential solutions, if we really think proactively about how to embrace them. Yes. Um, you know, that's really the key. Well, I, I think of it the same way you do too, Bill, I think. Um, you have to embrace them, but you also have to think, uh, is this something that's really going to add value? Um, we always talk about the automation journey. You don't automate a bad process. So you wouldn't want to apply artificial intelligence, for example, to a bad process. It's not going to help you. Um, so you're doing it for the right reason. But then um, getting with any good change management system, you, you want to get the people involved that are really on the ground, uh, doing the, the work, using the technology. That's what we did in the parasitology laboratory when we... I. I shared with my technical specialist that I was interested in this digital artificial intelligence pathology uh, parasitology platform. She read it over, said it looked cool. Okay, let's try it. But then it wasn't just us saying, we're going to use this. It was, well, let's let all of the laboratory staff try it out, see what they think about it. We evaluated a couple different systems. The staff really embraced it. They saw a lot of potential in it. And then they did the evaluation, the validation, and then the eventual implementation. And I oversaw all of it, but I didn't step in and tell them, no, do it this way versus that way. I, I, I drove the validation to make sure we were doing all the right things, but I let them really drive the process. And I think that was one of the reasons we are su successful. I think that's what we're going to have to do because these technologies can be so disruptive. You need to make sure you have buy-in from your group. 
Yeah, no, I, that's a great, it's a great story. B, I completely agree. And as you're talking, it made me think of a couple of things that, you know, for our audience who might be listening, what, what do we need to think about, right? Beyond just embracing and, and, and the technology, it's really twofold. Number one is that one thing that really sets us up for success is our focus as a, as a profession on quality systems, right? It's part of every lab that we're inspected mm -hmm. at the quality systems that we put in place. That makes it the labs and the kind of the, the perfect environment to bring these tools in and establish if they really add value and do so in a way that serves patients through both through quality, safety, and efficiency, right? And accuracy and all those things. So we're, we are conditioned actually to, to think in the ways that we need to be thinking for these tools to be adopted. So they shouldn't be as intimidating to us as we might think they would be. The other is I think about the other hat, which I know you've worn many, and that is on the education piece, mm -hmm. right? And to really think about how we're training and A, the power of these tools to democratize education um, through digital environment, but the also um, the reality is that new, younger generations are much more comfortable. Uh, kids that went to school with iPads are gonna be a lot more comfortable in terms of adopting the technologies. And so to think about this as an opportunity to get out there and get, you know, new people coming into the workforce interested in this intersection of technology and, and their job is the labs mm -hmm. are actually really, if we embrace it, it could be a whole new way for us to draw in a, a, a workforce that's really motivated to explore the uses and do the innovation themselves. Well, you bring up an important point, Bill, and that is we're probably going to need specialists, laboratorians who have some specialty or interest in technology such as digital pathology and artificial intelligence. Right now in my laboratory, we have developers who are really good at developing a PCR assay or a sequencing based assay. I have a feeling that my developers of the future are going to be really good at training artificial intelligence algorithms and validating them. So it's gonna be new skill sets. And for people who really enjoy that, I think it's a great opportunity. Yeah, it, it's, it, yeah it, there's so many ways you could take this, but when you think about test development, the other thing, if you look at other industries in the pharmaceutical industry, they now, like they can run literally hundreds of thousands of quote, in silico mm -hmm. biological trials to identify targets that were never even seen before, right? There was a couple, I think actually they're antimicrobials that were discovered by in silico analysis of the target and just modeling what they what thought would be, what the computer determined would be effective and then finding an actual, either creating, synthesizing, or finding a naturally occurring. So it could change a lot of things. Um, but the most important thing is that it's another, to your point, it's another tool in our job. You could get a mm -hmm. great program that could say, hey, what's the best primer set for this target? But if you don't know why you're developing a test, right. how it's going to be used to improve a patient's life, you're, it's not going to do that much good. So um, it still so, yeah, comes so, down to our engagement and our role as the, the leaders in the laboratory. We still need to be making sure we're doing things for the right reasons and driving what we're doing. Exactly. Exactly. Because whether it's a light cycler or an algorithm, our mm -hmm. job is to really think about how it creates value for a patient when it's used. And when it does so, it does so reliably and safely and everything else. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure we will be talking about a lot more artificial intelligence and generative AI uh, and other forms of AI in the future. So I'll look forward to that. Yeah, me too. And I think, you know, over time, maybe we'll, we'll see some that are things, use cases that are really interesting and we'll talk in more detail. We've talked in generalities, but you have the one specific example. We'll see, I'm sure more and more. Oh, there out. will be many more. We'll have plenty to talk about. No doubt. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. See you next week. Sounds good. See you later. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.